I am so excited to be in the Women Know Cyber book. We absolutely know cyber, and I am the first one featured. And I like to think I'm the first one featured because, you know, I'm just that fabulous, but it's in alphabetical order. <laughs> Why did I write the book, Women Know Cyber, 100 Fascinating Females Fighting Cybercrime? It goes back to following women in cybersecurity because I have daughters, I had a personal interest in it. We're a media property, it's something we're aware of. And I felt there was a lot of negative commentary that was turning young girls and women off as opposed to attracting them to the field. I wanted to put out media that didn't necessarily contest that, but that would be more of a positive commentary, highlight the women who are in the field. I felt like that was the best thing we could do to attract young women and really any woman to the field. Cybersecurity Ventures predicts that women will hold 25% of cybersecurity jobs globally by the end of 2021. The number of cybersecurity positions filled by women in 2021 is nearly double what it was in 2013, but is still way too low, and the industry needs to continue pushing for more females to join. Cyber is so important because the digital age is recreating everything around us, and women are not at the table, we're not behind the computer screen, rewriting the world around us, and we're half of the population. I feel like women have just a natural ability for social etiquette, communications, you know, emotional intelligence. They connect dots a lot and see the big picture, and that just helps the, the broader team. When you're faced against an adversary that's always thinking about new ways to attack, the more diversity of thought, the better your chances for a successful outcome. Cybersecurity Ventures predicts cybercrime damages will cost the world $6 trillion annually in 2021. That's $500 billion a month, or $115 billion a week, or $16.4 billion a day, or $685 million an hour, or $11.4 million a minute, or $190,000 a second. No matter how you calculate it, Cybercrime is the fastest growing type of crime globally. Cybersecurity has a compelling factor, a human factor. It's to protect, to secure, to nurture. This is a dynamic space. It is a constantly expanding space. I mean, the growth in the cybersecurity market is going to be over 10 trillion in the next five years. So the opportunities are endless. A lot of what drives who's interested in cybersecurity has to do with how we talk about it. If you look at the way role definitions are written, if you look at the way it's portrayed in the world, it's portrayed through a very specific light. And that light is highly technical, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's written in words that don't always appeal to a broader audience. And I think the misconception is that it is everything in cybersecurity fits that mold, but there is no mold. Cybersecurity has no mold. Cybersecurity impacts us in so many ways. It impacts us in terms of our financial information, our personal identity. It impacts us in terms of, you know, how we interact on the internet and how it stores or tracks our information. And I think we need to have more women to inform those decisions. Cybersecurity Ventures predicts there will be 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs in 2021, up from 1 million openings in 2014. Despite industry-wide efforts to reduce the skills gap, the open cybersecurity headcount in 2021 will be enough to fill 50 NFL stadiums. Everyone knows we have a major cybersecurity pipeline issue, especially with small businesses and cyber hacks happening every single day. The first place that we can start is gender diversity. If young girls can see female role models in the area of cybersecurity, they may say, I want to be like that. Oh, wow, I didn't know you could do it. Can I follow in her footsteps? So showing young ladies the way will really increase, hopefully, the pipeline, then getting interested in the field and staying in the field, becoming leaders in the field. What we need to do is create an awareness that STEM fields are there and they're not made for any specific gender. There are careers for all. That's what girls don't see, 
when they see a majority of boys in pop culture or talked about in society. So that's what we need to break. When girls see themselves represented in the voices of professionals, whether that be someone who comes from a similar walk of life as they do, or similar socioeconomic background, maybe speaks the same mother tongue as they do, those are all so powerful in a young girl's life because they make you feel seen and they make you feel heard. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to make cybersecurity as a career, right? And it's not just a, a gender thing that is not only accessible to people, but one that they view as exciting. And for us, particularly, mission really matters. So if you want to work somewhere where you know that what you're doing is making the world a safer place, we talk at SecureWorks about our mission is to secure human progress. And so when you think about hospitals and vaccine makers and schools and, and you know, oil pipelines that are under attack, if, if you're part of the team that uh, the heroes that save those organizations or frankly prevent those from happening in the first place, I think the interest in this as a career path really starts to get a little more exciting. When a lot of people think about careers in tech, you think about coding and the technical aspects of it. But really, when you look at tech more broadly, it's a combination of creativity and technology. And that's what really drew me in, was the process of creating useful things that make people's lives better, being part of the digital revolution. My role at MasterCard is I lead our global digital identity business, which basically means that myself and my team are tasked with transforming the ecosystem of digital interactions to have more trust, where each individual brings their own digital identity and can therefore seamlessly prove you are who you claim to be when interacting through digital channels. It's a dream job, it's innovative, it's impactful, and yeah, I feel very fortunate <laughs> that MasterCard found me and, and I love it. I get asked a lot how someone with an advertising public relations communications degree wound up doing cybersecurity. I started in my career as a technical recruiter and I was putting people to work in these fields and they were making a lot more money than I was. And I remember sitting and thinking, this doesn't seem that hard, I could do this. And so I was really fortunate to find a company that offered training. I made the shift to cybersecurity, and at the time we didn't even really call it cybersecurity, when I was working on a military project, and we were trying to move our infrastructure from one physical location to another. And as we were standing up this new architecture, I asked the question of who's going to secure the devices, because we have this list of guidelines that we have to implement. And the people around the room looked at me and said, well, you knew enough to ask the question, so that's your job. And that was really my first leap into starting to understand how we need to secure our devices and what that means for business processes and what that means for workflow.
I have the unique pleasure of serving as the training director for the National Security Agency. They gave me the title of Commandant, which is a Department of Defense terminology, just for a leader of running a large organization. I run the National Cryptologic School. We're a national treasure. We get to teach in the areas of cyber, cryptology, language, leadership, and business, analysis, and reporting. We have a high concentration of mathematicians, computer scientists, language analysts. And why do we do that? It's because intelligence professionals tend to stay intelligence professionals for many decades and things keep changing and the technology gets more and more sophisticated, the adversaries, their tactics are more and more sophisticated and we need to keep up with that and stay ahead of that. Americans deserve the best intelligence professionals they can have, the most well-trained and the most prepared so we stay safe as a country. I was in graduate school and I was interning at a healthcare system and I got into IT by accident. During my CIO role at uh, GE Energy, that's when I was really uh, you know, first exposed to cybersecurity. I'm a person who loves to be challenged and you know, solve messy problems and do things that people haven't done before and we get that chance every day in cyber, it's a new world. Honestly, I never pictured myself as uh, becoming a CEO, uh, let alone the CEO of SecureWorks. Careers just kind of take a path of seizing opportunities when they come along. And, and frankly, this industry was non-existent in its current form when uh, I was in school and, and uh, early career. While I was in business school, what I realized was I wanted to be in a company at the industry that was technologically focused. And so cybersecurity was both interesting, important, emerging technologically, and frankly, lets you do something that's pretty important to the world each day. I joined the intelligence community after 9-11. That certainly motivated my desire to go work for the government. I joined the Defense Intelligence Agency. I started out working as a cyber threat analyst focused on uh, terrorist use of the internet. That was taking disparate pieces of intelligence. It could be open source intelligence, it could be signals intelligence, human intelligence, synthesizing all of that into a precise and consolidated document that would be briefed to our decision makers throughout the intelligence community up to the President of the United States. I'm really grateful that Know Before, like the agency, has worked really hard on focusing on diversity. We've got scholarship now for young women in college that can also apply for internships, and then, hey, if you wow us as an intern, we'd love to have you on board. So don't tell yourself no, tell yourself yes, and apply. The thing for me that makes a career in cyber so fulfilling is the fast-paced, always changing environment. And when you think about some of the areas, like incident response, dealing with incident response and helping an organization, especially if they're suffering from a complete business outage, I mean, you're like at the front lines. It's super exciting. You're trying to help them figure out, like, not, not even necessarily how did the bad guy get in and what did he get to. It's how are we going to get this organization back up? We do not have any of our technical capabilities in place. How are we going to recreate this organization and how fast can we do it? And what are we going to do in the meantime? I mean, it's, it's really exciting.
Lots of my career shifts and changes center around my three children. I had just come back from a very short maternity leave with my second, Aiden. My executive assistant said to me, a call came in from the White House today and they'd like you to call them back. And at that time that I got the call, I was working at Bank of America. I was managing the technology and operations for the fraud unit for the bank. The president wanted to see new faces, new names, new types of resumes, more minorities, and more women. Had the honor of being offered the job and said yes, and my family supported me every step of the way. I commuted every week for two and a half years back and forth between Charlotte, North Carolina, to Washington, D.C. Um, for the honor of serving. My nickname is Dr. J, and I kind of coined that nickname when I got my PhD. I wanted to brand myself and, and make it resonate with other people. And I know of Dr. J from the basketball fame, and I thought he was just always very creative. And I wanted to bring the same level of creativity and range that Dr. J brought to basketball. I want to bring the same thing to cybersecurity. So that's kind of where Dr. J comes from. I am a certified cryptologic engineer. It is a specialized training that the Department of Defense takes you through. You can be a certified cryptologic engineer, a certified cryptologic mathematician. There are different tracks. I took the engineering track, and that's kind of how I started my career. I started my career within the Department of Defense, building algorithms that go into a lot of the cryptographic systems. was born and brought up in Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh. I studied applied physics and electronics in University of Dhaka. At that time, we didn't have computer science, but my senior project involved programming and I just absolutely fell in love with it. After spending two years in software industry as a software developer. My husband and I came to United States, um, went to Mississippi State University for doctoral studies in computer science. My doctoral dissertation involved infusing data from multiple intrusion detection systems and making an overall sense of network health using possibilistic reasoning. Once I completed my degree, my husband and I were fortunate to get job offers at Tennessee Tech and joined the faculty in 2006. At that time, I was the only cybersecurity faculty, so I started to build a cybersecurity program. In 2016, we established the cybersecurity concentration in computer science. And over the last few years, enrollment has quadrupled in that concentration. Currently at Tech, we offer bachelor's, master's, and PhD program in cybersecurity for computer science students. And it has the highest enrollment in our school. Dr. Siraj is one of my role models because she's the reason that I got into cybersecurity in the first place. Because so when I knew I was coming to tech, I knew I wanted to do computer science, but she helped me sort of pick my concentration. I know myself and so many others would not have had the opportunities that we've had without her sheer unbridled enthusiasm for the field. She got me involved with the Women in Cybersecurity student chapter here before it was even associated with that nonprofit organization. She has helped me in so many ways and is the reason that I actually have a job offer after graduation. So. Because of her hard work, Tennessee Tech is NSA DHS designated. We have partners with the DOD and the Department of Energy, and Tennessee Tech has the first and largest cyber core SFS program in the state of Tennessee. Dr. Siraj is awesome. She's um, helped me with my leadership skills. I'm the president of the Women in Cybersecurity Tennessee Tech student chapter. 
Um, she's helped me give back to the community through the uh, Tennessee Tech Cybersecurity Education Research and Outreach Center and she's helped me give back to my country by helping me get into the CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program. So she's just really opened all these doors that's led me to not only be a better student, but also a better cybersecurity professional and a better person overall, I like to think. I mean, when I was the CEO of the Girl Scouts, I realized that every girl had a mobile device in her hands and she wanted to be more than a user of technology. She wanted to be the creator, inventor, and designer. We were doing focus groups with girls all around the country about what kind of STEM badges they wanted next. And in every part of the country, whether it was rural, urban, and suburban, girls were talking about privacy and how to protect themselves online, which is basically cybersecurity. With that information, we were able to then put together a program with Palo Alto Networks. And what we were able to tie together is that because of Girl Scouts, we had a national network of girls. We had a national interest in cybersecurity and that we could reach girls in urban, rural, and suburban communities to create the workforce of the future for cyber. It's very important that more girls and women go into the cyber field, and Palo Alto Networks was very focused on that because they realized that they could not meet their workforce needs in the United States unless more women became involved in cyber. So it was a great partnership. That investment that they made in Girl Scouts, they helped us not just with funding it, but also with subject matter expertise. I was fortunate to have been a trailblazer, to have great opportunities. I had a great eight years as a board member at Girl Scouts, four years as a CEO, so 12 years there. Fantastic, amazing run. I know in my last year as a CEO of Girl Scouts, you know, we had over a million STEM badges earned and over 180,000 cybersecurity badges. But now my focus is how do we get more diversity, inclusion, and technology so that everyone has an opportunity to be part of the world that's being recreated around us. We need to have everyone's voices in, and we need to make sure that they're part of the solution. Serving the Israeli Defense Forces is mandatory for any Israeli who turns 18. It was no different for me, and so I wanted to be a pilot, but it wasn't allowed back then for women, so I did the closest thing possible, and I was serving in the operations room of an F-15 squadron. Israel is tiny, 8,600 square miles. The government took upon herself as a strategy to make Israel a cyber nation. And with that, they have founded the Israeli National Cyber Directorate that is supposed to put together regulations, education funds, incentives for companies and for people to learn computer science, to go into cyber and be able to extend our ability to protect ourselves also in the virtual world. I think that all the countries and all the governments need to work together in order to increase the investment of women in cyber and by doing that to double the workforce. This will definitely create more minds that think differently and be able to come up with innovative uh, solutions to bridge the gap that has been created or is continuously being created between attackers and defenders. to call myself a hacker. In 2014, I became the first Israeli woman to present at the international prestigious TED event. And I was easily one of the most anonymous people on that stage. 
The room was filled with the likes of Bill Gates and Sergey Brin, Hollywood celebrities and tech gurus. My speech about hackers, the internet's immune system, really captured people's imagination. And I think it's because many people knew that hackers are not always the bad guys. My point of view is that hackers play a crucial role in our world. They expose vulnerabilities. They force us to evolve. And through the TED stage, I share that message with millions of people around the world. For the past three decades, hackers have done a lot of things, but they have also impacted civil liberties, innovation, and internet freedom. I absolutely believe that media representation influences people's career choices. For me, as a young woman, seeing a character of a teenager hacker girl in a movie changed the course of my life. So today, I work with a lot of different types of mediums and media to make sure that we can see all sorts of hackers represented because this absolutely makes a difference. And that's also one of the reasons we started the leading cyber ladies movement. We originally started it in 2015 here in Israel. And the idea was to bring together women in cybersecurity that were already leading, successful, making an impact and highlighting their work making them more visible and connecting these ladies with aspiring cyber ladies, with younger women looking for their path into the cybersecurity world. We now have sister chapters in Toronto, Canada, New York City in New York, in the UK, in Europe, and soon in Tokyo, Japan. Our community numbers almost 2,000 cyber ladies from all over the world. So the idea is really to bring these ladies together and to provide them with a stage so that we can lead together towards greater equality and diversity in the cybersecurity ecosystem. There's a job for everyone in cybersecurity. It's not just for coders and techies. No matter where your interest lies, cars, gaming, healthcare, law enforcement, business, marketing, or something else, you'll be surprised by the variety of positions that are available. When we talk about women in cybersecurity and whether or not there is a lack of women in cybersecurity, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at this. If you were to take someone like me, I don't have a degree in computer science. And so if we're using that as the scale to measure the number of women in cybersecurity, then our numbers are gonna be way off. What I'm starting to see is that hiring managers and companies are realizing they need to look outside the confines of just a cybersecurity degree or a computer science degree to find those people that really round out their cyber team. Because you can have people who are very technical running your security operations center, but if you don't have someone who can truly communicate what the threat is and what the risk to the business is, then your message is gonna be lost in translation. And so when we're talking about women in cybersecurity, I would challenge that and I would say, what is the definition of cybersecurity? You can be a strategist, you can be a technologist, you can focus in talent, you can be a data expert, you can focus in on third party relationships and the broader ecosystem of how businesses do work and how they you know, exchange information and data and customers. There's so many different paths that you can take. A lot of it is really focused in on understanding a client's business, understanding the motivation of the adversary, understanding the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities. And we all know that one of the biggest vulnerabilities as it relates to cyber is people. So how much people work is there to do there, right? So I think the biggest misconception is just that it's this narrow niche place and it's not. It's a really broad field filled with all kinds of different careers and all kinds of opportunity. Cyber has a lot of different facets. I was always very technical and analytical background, so it was easy for me, a natural fit, but a lot of people are not, and I think they're scared of it. So I think it's just important to step back and, and introduce folks to this world and what the opportunities are, because it's not so scary. They think it's just somebody kind of coding at a computer in the background, you know, in their basement, and it's there's a lot to it that we have to add.
The very first time that I saw myself that I could be a woman in cybersecurity was when I saw Felicity Smoke on the arrow. I saw her as this empowering female superhero who was changing the world with every line of code that she would write. And she would feed in information to Oliver Queen who was on the street chasing down bad actors. Like that sort of energy, it made me feel like I could do anything. Up until I was in ninth grade, I didn't really know what cybersecurity was, but it was from my dad and those like dinner conversations that I would have with him because he was a fraud examiner in Canada before he, they immigrated my mom and dad to the US. And so it was from those conversations that I think set up really well, like an interest in cybersecurity. So I went to a gen cyber camp after that point, which was a week of inspiration and empowerment and um, from there is where things really started to make sense. Gen Cyber is a camp program to really spark interest with our young Americans into the field of cybersecurity. So this camp was started with a partnership with the National Science Foundation seven years ago, and it has really grown. Uh, this year, we're going to have 154 camps across 44 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. We have camps now that are dedicated for ADHD students. We have a camps that are designed, which are quite amazing, the visually impaired. Uh, they use cipher rings to teach encryption. And we also have deaf and hard of hearing. So the, the innovation that's happening in education and cyber, it's phenomenal. We have seen that 56% of the camp participants didn't even really know about cybersecurity before they started. And when they left, 67% said they're interested in a career in cybersecurity. That's phenomenal. To go from zero to 67% interest is really amazing. I always look back at Gen Cyber with really fond memories and I recommend it for any student interested in cybersecurity. It was from a Google search. I just Googled like cybersecurity camps near me and I found that Gen Cyber was pretty close. It was at Purdue University. So I went down to Purdue for one summer, the summer before my freshman year of high school. And that summer was super transformative for me because it was the conversations that I had with professors at Purdue who were working on the front lines of cybersecurity research that really made it click for me that cyber was a place that needed a lot of change, but also was ripe for impact. And so it was professors who were working in things across like digital forensics and working with law enforcement to ensure that, you know, we were tracing back all the data sources we could, all the way to a professor in psychology who was understanding the psychology behind why hackers hacked systems and how information came on the dark web. And it was also conversations I had with students and the peer-to-peer -peer connections that I made talking in the dorm lobby until 2 a.m. in the morning about things like information on the dark web um, that really opened my eyes to a world that I had not seen before. And it was from there that I just left the conference and the event thinking to myself that when I grow up or when I'm even right now, like I wanna be the type of person who could talk about this sort of passion for hours and hours on end. And it, it was from that like, I think curiosity and desire of mine to pursue that passion to like continue my work with Bits and Bytes. Bits and Bytes Cybersecurity Education is a national nonprofit that is dedicated to educating and equipping all vulnerable populations from the ages of five to the ages of 95 and above with the cybersecurity and privacy awareness skills needed for the future. And we started in 2016. So it's been about five years now where we've been empowering students and other populations to understand cybersecurity and implement some risk mitigation tactics in their own lives. I believe in the United States, just like we talk to kids through K through 12 around having a foreign language that you study and think about at least through 10th grade, there's another language we need to be teaching and that's the language of technology. We should be K through 12 exposing our students to all different disciplines within STEM and doing a focused concerted effort that we don't do the 
let's have you be safe online and be a good digital citizen K through second. And then we leave them alone until the end and then it's all about gaming. We're, we're missing an incredible opportunity in between to get people very comfortable in a very you know low risk way that these are capabilities that you have that you can do. It's imperative for us as business leaders to help work with the educators, to give them ideas and to bring them along in terms of where the professions are going and how do we enable and how do we train and how do we teach our children you know, the skills that will give them the opportunities in the future. To parents and educators, uh, talking to kids about a future in this field, I'd really encourage a couple things. One, I think all of us could benefit from just a higher level of basic cyber literacy. Kind of like in years past, we've, we've started in on, on school age kids with financial literacy or health and nutrition literacy. And frankly, setting those foundations not only makes it harder for the adversary to, uh, to get our information, it, it's the beginning of an interest and a potential career path there. And so I think if we can leverage the great work that's been done in recent decades by universities, nonprofits, corporations, and schools around um, STEM career uh, opportunity pathing, then frankly, just highlighting cybersecurity as one of the key opportunities there uh, is I think a great way to, to let kids think about pursuing a career that they can both make a, a great living in uh, in a field that's growing and sustainable, but also to um, be proud of how they spend their day and how they earn their living. The skills you need to be successful in this career, you can get those through education, through college, through background and training that you get. A lot, though, uh, get it through on-the-job training. Being a part of getting to know the folks there, getting to start to work on projects or initiatives there gives you exposure, lets you get a taste for it, see if it's something that you want to do. I, I have a great example of that. I had one of my administrative assistants. She had an opportunity to see all of the things that we do in the security field. One of the things that she really found an affinity for was our computer forensic program. And our computer forensic program, it's accredited the same way that the FBI or Secret Service or Department of Defense labs are. She was really interested in it. She get a chance to help them work through managing their evidence. That was the project that got her close to it. When she really liked it, then we put her into training for it, and now she's a certified forensic examiner for us. With Ron's guidance and support, I was able to get a role inside of the digital forensic lab as an evidence technician. And while I was there, I created a process that we're using today to maintain a chain of custody for all of our physical evidence coming into the lab. Once that process was up and running, I was able to transition into a role of an e-discovery investigator. And now today I'm managing the day-to-day -day operations of our e-discovery program. So if it hadn't been for Ron taking that chance on me and re recognizing my potential, I would never be where I am today. I never would have in a million years thought that I would have gone from an accounting manager to an administrative assistant to a cybersecurity professional, but here I am and I'm doing great at it. Cybersecurity is fun. If you are an individual that enjoys life, likes to learn, likes to be collaborative, enjoying teaming with other people, you should really consider cybersecurity. And if you're in cybersecurity, mentor someone else to come into the field as well. It's such an amazing place to give back to our country, to make us more secure, to make our economic security even stronger, and together, we're a, we're a better nation for it. We're talking about a field where there is truly an opportunity for young people for girls in particular, for women you know, of any age who are thinking about the field, to do exactly what police officers do, what military men and women do, namely protecting our country. It's an opportunity to serve and protect. I believe that's primarily why people choose law enforcement or they choose uh, to go into the military. Getting involved with cyber is that same decision, it's that same opportunity. It just so happens that most of the protection uh, and, and the opportunity is in the private sector. This industry needs all the help it can get, which is why I'm extremely excited that some future hackers are going to come from the Girl Scouts program and they're going to come 
from young girls that would be curious about technology just like I was. I think there is room in cybersecurity for everyone and women can make the difference.